So yes, we're going to talk today about the impact of uh, speech, uh, impact of uh, cleft lip and palate on, on speech. And I would like, this is my outline for the morning, and I would like first to ask to look at some sounds, how sounds are typically made uh, by babies, because normally when we talk about the impact, we tend to be looking at the older children, but we're starting from the very little ones today. So we look at some of the anatomical constraints and the impact of cleft lip and palate at this period. Early phonological development in infants with cleft lip and palate. And then the impact on communication in general, because speech is an aspect of communication. And so uh, I just want to put it in context that speech, uh, speech is an aspect and communication is actually the broader picture. And the cleft lip and palate does affect um, the bigger picture, the communication of, uh, of the child or the person who has um, the cleft. Uh, so, and then we look at the impact of the cleft lip and palate on the speech on older children. So the impact of um, cleft lip and palate on the speech of older children. That's how we should read, sorry. Then we look at some solutions or what has uh, so far, some of the things that have been done to make it easier and to support um, the speech and to make the speech better. And then we have a summary and a couple of videos that look at um, before and afters for some children. And so before I actually launch in, I just want to say a very big thank you to Smile Train for offering me this opportunity. And uh, a massive, huge 165% thank you to Miss NK for all her support and for getting me here today. I'm not sure where I would have been without her this weekend. So then, we start, we have to look at how speech is made. So we look first at how speech is made and then we look at how, when that is impact upon, it affects, uh, it affects it. Uh, and maybe, hopefully, the majority of us will know about the villain and the role of the villain, but we're going to look at it again in some of the videos. So if you look at the picture that's on the screen right now, we, our mouth, in, in, in our mouth, we have uh, the palate, which is the part that sometimes gets uh, the cleft, and then we have um, the nasal cavity and then the oral cavity. So the two separate chambers, but sometimes because of when, when cleft happens, then it kind of freezes into one, it becomes one large space in, in our mouth. So I'm going to have um, a video just now just to look at how the sounds are made. So first, the sounds that are made via the um, nasal capsule, so the, the nostril, the sounds that go through the nose will be seen first and then we we'll see some of the other sounds which go through the mouth and this is how it should be there are sounds that go through the mouth and there are sounds that go through the nose uh, and when cleft happens this can be affected and then it impacts on the speech so i'm just going to play that now So I just pause that for a little second and just explain that you know we saw in the first part how all the sounds, the air that was traveling through went via the nasal cavity, but it went through the nose, it did not go through the mouth. Now most of the sounds will be going through the mouth. And I want you to watch the movement of that green um, strike there, which is the velum, which is acting as a velum there. 
So you see how it moves up to close off the, the nostril, to close off the nasal uh, parts of um, the cavity so that the sounds will travel only through the mouth. Please watch the movement of the tongue as well. The tongue is that brown bit that is below the blue area, and the blue area is the oral cavity, so that's the mouth and the sounds going through the mouth. And watch the tongue for the different sounds and how the tongue is moving back and to the front and to the middle sometimes um, as the sound is being made. I'm just going to do two more sounds and then we'll move on. Okay, thank you very much. So I need you to also record that in your memory somewhere because when we look at the older children, we'll be looking more at how the velum, um, damage the velum can affect the sounds that the child is making. So that is how sounds are typically made. And now I want us to look at uh, young children. So little children who have had a, a cleft palate, lip or palate. But before that, we look at the normal development, so how the, um, the oral cavity and the nasal cavity and everything develops normally. So when a child is born, when they are little, the infant's vocal tract uh, has an elevated larynx, so the larynx is a little bit up. Epiglottis is much closer to the soft palate, and if you look at the pictures down, you get a, an idea of what I'm talking about. Um, and then the tongue tends to fill because the tongue tends to fill much of the mouth because the mouth, um, they, 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 there's not enough space uh, in the mouth yet. And much of the sounds are from the back. So vocalization of, um, lacks some kind of resonance. Resonance is how the sound is moving about in the mouth area. So uh, we hear a lot of shrill. From, from babies and there's a lot of ah and, ah and stuff like that. So it's very sure and it's from the back. And if you look at the pictures of the adults and the child, you can see how very much the adults is more vertical and the infant is a little bit horizontal and the tongue fills much of it. Now from about four months, the larynx descends uh, into the pharynx. So it's moving downwards a bit more. And then it's creating more space between the soft palate and the epiglottis. So now you are getting, you are creating more of uh, two resonating uh, cavities. There's the oral and the pharyngeal. And the mobile, the tongue has become a little bit more mobile because now there's been some shift. There's more movement in the mouth. So the child is able to begin to make a few more, uh, some more sounds. Uh, and there's more vocal play. So the child is doing a lot more of sounds like 
uh, blowing raspberries and other funny sounds so, and, and, and canonical babbling. So there's, you know, when you, you do those sounds with your, with your lips, they are uh, blowing raspberries. So there's the <laughs> sounds with the lips. Uh, all those are very important later for, uh, for talking. They can pout their lips. They can make uh, kissing um, gestures or movements with their lips. So they can do the movement and they can do the spreading. And there's a lot of different movements that they can do with their lips. And then we have babbling starts around this time from about four months. Children start to babble. Um, before that, there's a lot of echo and cooing. But now they're doing a more babbling, and there's a lot more of what we call canonical babbling. And canonical babbling has to do with um, like the multi syllabic babbling. So there's more of the ga 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 and the ba 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 and the da 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 and uh, all those various sounds coming up now. So there's more repetitive uh, uh, sounds. The child is making more repetitive sounds. And, um, and also learning the position of the tongue in the mouth and learning how they are making that sounds in their mouth. So all that is being recorded in their memory when the child is making all those fun sounds uh, as they are growing up. Uh, so there's lots of vocal practice and then it's easier to help. It helps them in later to execute uh, words when they have to. Baby has the opportunity to monitor their own speech sounds and how they are making those movements in their mouth for the sound. Uh, then baby's early words begin with sounds practiced and refined during babbling. So there is um, there is the um, study, studies have shown that the sounds that the child tends to make a lot are likely to be some of the sounds that they they will make when they first start talking. So I I find that sounds like, you know, b, like in baby, you find younger children, uh, little babies that are even uh, one year old and 18 months old who have started talking, uh, able to say words like baby, mama, baba, uh, those sounds that are more in the front. Bye-bye, uh, bye-bye is a very common one. A lot of children tend to say bye-bye as well. So you find that the sounds that they've been practicing tend to help them in the early stages when they start talking. And um, engaging with a child is also very important because engaging with a child helps the child to make, uh, to practice these sounds. But you can also tell that even though the child is making some sound, it still feels a little bit more back, quite high. It's very important to engage the child and to um, get the child, sometimes read intentions into the child's communication. Um, and then now we, we can't appreciate the sound. Um, I will try and guide you on sharing the, your computer sound. You can't hear the sound? No. So oh, at the, uh, where your, your controls are, whether at the bottom or at the top, at where they end and there are three dots, if you click on them, there's an option for share computer sound. Okay. Okay, sorry. <laughs> you can hear now? Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> okay, you're fed up. Okay, I'll pick you up. I'll pick you up. Okay. Okay.
You and Goji Cut. Um, what's happening? Tell me about her. <laughs> really? Is that what happened? No way. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> wow. Tell me about it. Okay, I'll be. Okay, I'll be. It's a valid. That's a valid complaint, but still. Doesn't mean you have to cry. Keep using your words. Keep using your words. Okay, you're fed up. Okay, I'll pick you up. I'll pick you up. Okay. 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 <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and I'll come. I'll come to that in a minute too about the importance of engaging the child and importance. And, and when you watch the child, the child is moving their tongue and their mouth around in their mouth, and it, it sounded. It felt like a conversation. It felt that the child was having a conversation with the with the parents. So, but when we come to, and now we look at the, um, what happens when babies with clefts. So for a start, there are constraints with, with the child's lip because if there is a, a cleft in the lip, then the child is going to have difficulties making the bilabial sound. So the purse and the buzz, uh, the child is going to have difficulty making those sounds. And then all those blowing non-speech movements that I, I talked about earlier, all these non speech movements are going to be um, a challenge for the child. Feeding, which is um, also seen by some researchers as a good way of beginning communication um, with the mom. So there's this burst and pauses, so you, you, the child suckles for a little bit and then there is a little break, and then mom might say something, just as we saw in the earlier video of mom having a conversation with the child and seeing uh, the movement. Um, that's the baby is also making with the with the legs and and um, yeah and the conversational tone of it or the conversational nature of it. Now, for many uh, children with uh, who have a cleft lip and, and palate, it might be difficult, especially if it's a cleft lip. Uh, it might be, feeding can um, be a, a challenge, and um, many parents find it a struggle feeding. Um, the children and going through. So it's actually an extra work. Uh, having a child with a cleft, learning how to feed the child, and then trying to have conversation and trying to make it fun and trying to do all that at the same time. That is a lot for parents who have uh, a child with a cleft. So much of those uh, bantering and having fun and enjoying the child in the early stages can be missing because you are focusing and maybe concentrating on how to get this child fed and get this child healthy and strong so that when the time comes and it's right, that child can have the surgery that they need to have. So sometimes these things can be um, exchanged or avoided because there's no, there's no time to be doing that. You know, your focus is on getting the child fed and getting the child to thrive and be strong so that you'll be able to uh, get your surgery done at the right time. Um, and then when it comes to the palate, we also find that um, because there's a hole in the roof of the mouth, there's uh, avoidance of the hard palate as the key articulatory site. So that it's very difficult for the child, when, when you saw that movement of the velum and the tongue in the, in the earlier uh, video, um, for this child, the velum bit, the blue bit, that you saw, or the blue green, the green bit, um, it's split, maybe split open. And so the tongue moves and enters right towards the nostril area, so the nasal cavity area. And so when the tongue is moving, it's very difficult for the tongue to find a place to hit where it will make the appropriate sound that it has to make. So the child tends to avoid that part of the mouth and tries to look for another place to move the tongue. So there's coupling of oral and nasal cavities. So it's like it's kind of fused together. And this makes it very difficult for intraoral pressure, air pressure to, to happen. So you hear the sounds, the pa, the ba, the ta, those sounds come out with kind of force. So the tongue moves and then closes off the, um, 
sorry, the velum moves and closes up the gap at the back so that all the sound can come through the mouth and the tongue will move in the uh, position, um, position itself in the palate so that the particular sound that you are making will come out. Now, for a lot of children with a palate, um, a cleft in the palate, this can be uh, a huge difficulty. And so sounds become a bit distorted and more nasalized because they are coming via the nose instead of uh, through the mouth. So they're not coming through the mouth as uh, we would expect them to. And this leads to avoidance of early stop consonants. Many of the um, uh, children do not try to make these sounds because when they make them, it moves in a different direction. And it prohibits learning of oral airflow. So they, they do not learn how to get the flow through their mouth right from the start when they have the palate problem. Then there's also the middle ear disease for uh, children with cleft lip and palate, um, which can also affect your speech because, um, because the station tube is not working as well as it should when there is a, a cleft in the, in the palate, this can affect the station tube as well. So the muscles for the um, for supporting the airing of the tube, they also can get um, damaged. And so the drain is not draining um, the nasal cavity, you know, the, the cavities is not draining it as well as it should. And sometimes you can get otitis media or fluid mind together, and then children may have difficulties with certain speech sounds. So certain of some of the fine sounds are not heard as well as they should. So they may drop off sounds at the end of words, in the middle of words, with certain fine sounds like the s's and the t and the curse sometimes will be missing from their vocabulary or from their words. So we do, we do a little com comparison of uh, babies without cleft palates and babies with uh, unrepaired cleft palates and the phonology and how their phonology develops. So for babies without cleft palate, we find that the site of activity focus shifts from the pharynx and glottis um, to produce more anterior and alveolar sounds. So as a baby, uh, we say that because of the coupling of the nasal and oral cavities in earlier, um, the sounds are at the front. But you know, with time, when there's more room in the cavities, it shifts towards the, the, the back. So they are making more, sorry, it's in the back to start off with, and then it shifts more towards the, the front. So uh, when they are babies, they are going nah, nah, and you, see, you hear most of the sound is in the back, from the back. But now they are doing more bubba bubba sounds and pop up sounds and doing raspberries, you know, at the front of their mouth and doing more in the front because there's more room now and, and there's a shift. Now for babies uh, with unrepaired cleft from about six months, this is from children from about six months, uh, you find that they are having this, so this alveolar takeover, which is what the study calls it, uh, does not happen for babies with clefts. Then again, uh, babies without clefts, they're able to produce a wide and varied range of consonants, more multisyllabic, as I said earlier. Uh, for babies with unrepaired clefts, there are fewer range of consonants and they avoid alveolus and palatal consonants. Palatal consonants will be the ones that, uh, that will hit, um, you need their palates to be able to make those sounds. Just and the das and the pass and just and cha and much of those sounds will be in, in the palate. You need the palate a lot. But they, they tend to stick to low pressure consonants, you know, where and yeah and ha because it's easier and uh, it doesn't need the same kind of force as the high pressure consonants that pass and the bus and the bus need. And they sound more nasal and they may use more nasals as well. Um, and, and there's less of the multisyllabic productions for babies with unrepaired cleft palates. Then there's also a large repertoire of practice sounds to which meaning can be attached to aid early word learning. You know, we saw in that little video with the mom interacting with her, with her baby, how she was interpreting uh, the sounds, putting, attaching meaning to it. And I believe that some of those sounds will be repeated so that it makes it easier for her to uh, try and make 
some meaning out of for the child as the child grows older and also learns more about the sound. Now, for babies with unrepaired third palates, there's uh, a reduced range, and this may even slow, may even slow the rate of expressive language acquisition. And then they also demonstrate some lexical selectivity. So the sounds they are able to make are more likely to be the sounds they're going to use more of. So the ms and the ms and the ms are more likely to be, and maybe the words and the yes are the sounds they are more likely to make. Um, and then um, large repertoire of practice sounds, a reduction and elimination of glottal stops as consonant inventory expands from six months. So for the regular, the baby with the uh, regular um, cavity and all the palate, they, they move from making the sounds from the bottom of the uh, cavity to the alveolar success, so less glottal sounds. But for children with um, unrepaired clefts, they still have the glottal, the glottal articulation persists, and this is often carried over into their first words as well and can become entrenched in developing their sound system. So that there's a lot of glottal stops they are doing the uh, uh, and um, much of what they're saying now, they're using the glottal stop instead of moving uh, to the front and picking up on the range of different sounds that you know, children who do not have. Athletes uh, will make. And then there's glottal and pharyngeal sounds incorporated in the phonemic range. So for many of these children, they incorporate glottal sounds and the um, um, pharyngeal sounds because they are the sounds that they can produce better and they include them in their range of phonemes, which makes a difference in um, the words that they, they, uh, they use. So that you will have a child who you ask them to say uh, seven, and because they're using the glottal stop for the S, because they've shifted the sound to the back, they're doing uh -uh, uh -uh. and then if you ask them to say pat or papa, they're still doing uh -uh. so the glottal stop is, is replacing the P, and it's also replacing the S. So the same glottal stop is replacing uh, both sounds, though they might, when you listen, Closely, you may find a slight difference in the way they say it, but it is the same glottal stop that is replacing the top and the surf for this child. And it becomes part of uh, the range that they use, which may need to be corrected later. Then other thing that also impact on, on speech or communication generally is the bonding. There's the difficulty with bonding for many, many families. When you carry your baby for nine months, and everybody is expecting, you know, bouncing baby boy, and I don't know, a pretty, chilly baby girl. Everybody's expecting this um, child, and then you have a child that has a cleft. And obviously, if you didn't know about it before, it can be very devastating for a lot of parents. And um, I mean, a lot of research is also suggested that no matter how much parents even know, ahead of time that they're going to have a child with a pet. Once the child lands on, on, on their laps, it is not an easy um, thing for many parents. They still find it very difficult to bond. They still find it very difficult to relate. And for many people, if you take my culture, for example, you find that um, a lot of these children are kept indoors. Um, the various ceremonies do not happen. Uh, the various... Um, uh, cultural practices and the outdooring and we have a naming and outdooring on the eighth day things should start happening a lot of these things will not happen and once the child is out to it's important that the child is hearing language and hearing language from all the different people the child is growing up with you know so the sounds that the child has started in from the mom's room once the child is out it's important the child should be hearing all these sounds around them but if the sounds and the uh, uh, kind of general atmosphere around the child may not always be uh, very helpful for bonding. And so all the, the bits I was talking about, the burst and pauses and the start of communication while the child is feeding or breastfeeding with the mom, 
a lot of these things can be missing. And as I said, if you are really focusing very hard, already many parents, many moms find it very difficult, some moms find it difficult anyway to, to learn to uh, breastfeed with, when there are no problems. So now when there's a, a challenge and you don't have anybody immediately around you who knows how to support this child. And so it can be very difficult for a lot of parents. Uh, you can't say, what is, people ask me what's happened to your baby, have you had a baby and you have to come up with all kinds of uh, excuses each time. So there is that which can affect um, the child's teach communication as well. Then we talk about the feeding, which can also uh, have issues and difficulties and affect the bonding and affect communication generally. Um, and then the hearing disease, middle ear disease, that can also affect, and the psychosocial uh, issues that arise out of these things. I mean, as early as four years, or maybe even earlier, because I have a little 18 months, uh, 20, 24 months old around the house, and already she knows what it is to look pretty and to look beautiful and to dress up and all that. So uh, self-concept starts quite early, and, and children, if they have an unrepaired cleft, um, maybe asking questions, and other children will also be asking questions, you know, attending school and a whole lot of issues can affect the child's early development of communication. Because if the child is feeling shy, the child is feeling uh, isolated uh, as they're growing and watching other children around them and finding that they are not the same, um, then they, it's, it becomes very difficult. They're not practicing the language, they're not practicing using sounds and they're not responding much. So it actually affects um, the child's development of uh, communication, of which speech is an aspect. Uh, and it is reported that, you know, there are some children whose general performance for the school time also gets affected as a result of this. So um, now we've had a look at um, the, uh, some of the challenges for younger children and babies we're going to look at how this then becomes a problem for older children. So the, the issues, the problems, I would say, start right from, the, from birth. So if it is not repaired from birth, then all the problems all the, that we've talked about will persist and the child, as the child goes older, they will have uh, even more challenges. So now we're going to look at how this carries through um, to affect older children. And for older children, um, we find that once there is a cleft palate, especially when there's a, a cleft lip, um, uh, the palate, you find that the, the, when the palate is damaged, they can have um, Vilopharyngeal in insufficiency, incompetence, or uh, a mislearning. So, and then it also this affects the resonance, which affects speech, the formation, which also affects speech, and then also the compensation is articulations, which is also something that affects speech. And then other areas that are affected will include like the oral structural deviation. So you have the dentition. Um, missing teeth and other things that can also, all those things can also um, affect the speech um, uh, of the child. Uh, and the hearing can also affect the speech of the child. So many of these things can be, affect the speech. So the velopharyngeal challenges, uh, dysfunction affects speech. And what's the velopharyngeal dysfunction? Velopharyngeal dysfunction uh, generally means that the velum, the velum is, is not functioning properly, it's not working uh, as well as, it's not acting as the valve that it should act um, like. So, uh, when we saw the earlier video, we saw, when we saw the earlier video, sorry, let me just switch it a bit quickly. When we saw the earlier video, we saw that the velum goes up, and closes off, and then the sound will go through the mouth, and then will go 
if it's to the villa will come down and the sun will go through the nose if it is uh, a nasal. Now, when we have vilopharyngeal insufficiency then of incompetence, then what tends to happen is that we have an unrepaired prep palate. And so the uh, velum is not, it's maybe short, it's not long enough to be able to uh, pull up and close off, or it has been weakened because of the, um, the damage to the um, levator uh, bellipalatinian uh, muscle. So that because the muscle is affected, the muscle that helps to push the uh, villum up has been damaged, then it is not maybe making that movement as well as it should. So villopharyngeal insufficiency and incompetency has to do with the villum not being able to do its work as well as, it's, um, as we expect it to. Now, sorry. So um, for villopharyngeal incompetency, we will have either a, a functional or a physiological challenge. So that the, the villum, the soft palate or the villum is not moving up as well as it should, as I said. And for the insufficiency, the, the, the villum may be short and that is usually a, a more of a structural problem. So unrepaired cleft, the villum is short, it's damaged. And so it has to be sorted and repaired before uh, it will be able to move up and close off the gap so that the sounds can come through um, and the mouth. And many of the children who have cleft uh, palate uh, have this, they have this difficulty. And we want to look at how this impacts and how this uh, the damage to the villum and the fact that the villum is unable to perform its role or its function as well as it should can affect um, the child's speech. So uh, villopharyngeal insufficiency causes um, abnormal coupling of nasal and oral cavities leading to excessive nasal resonance. So that when you are going to talk, because the sound is not coming through your mouth, but much of the sound is also escaping through your nose, there's too much nasal resonance. Speech is, um, we have speech, um, as we, when we started, we saw the sound, there are sounds that come through your mouth and sounds that come through your nose. So that if the sounds that are meant to come through your mouth come through your nose, then you have too much nasal resonance and then it sounds un un unacceptable and it can make you even unintelligible sometimes. So too much resonating in the nasal cavity when you talk. And this can happen because the uh, villum is not uh, structurally is not uh, capable of moving up to close off the gap. Uh, and also, uh, usually due to VPI of fistulas, you know, when you have a fistula as well, when the children have uh, a fistula, when uh, a repair has been done and um, maybe a fistula, um, they have a fistula later, that can also affect the sound, the resonance, because the, the sound will be coming through the hole. So most vowel sounds may be uh, affected and then oral consonants become nasalized. So uh, bo might sound more like an M and then the do might sound more like an N. So uh, do might sound a bit like when you're hyphenated and I sound hello, how are you? And it's very high pitch. It's, it sounds quite high pitch. Hi, and I am not here. How are you doing? And I'm here, okay, and stuff like that. So the speech coming through your nose can uh, make you sound hyper nasal, and that is not very uh, acceptable to the ears. So many people will, will have a second look at you to find out what could be wrong. Oh, no, no. Yeah. 
Yeah, you are spoken yeah, for forty-five minutes. So, so okay. it should be now. Okay. All right. So either that, or you can also have hyponasality, which means too little resonance, too little nasal resonance. So uh, all your high pressure sounds may sound like uh, nasal. So um, it feels a bit like when you've got a cold and somebody's talking when they've got a cold. So I'm going to move through very quickly now. Uh, so the sound feels very much like when someone has got a cold when they are hyponasal. So hyponasal is more um, like deep kind of voice a little bit. You can also have mixed nasality. And then you can also have the cold de sac resonance, which is uh, muffled speech. And many children with the palate problems do have muffled speech, so that they don't speak loud enough for you to hear. It's like they put it in the mouth kind of talking. So the voice sounds really muffled and it is low. Uh, and it kind of absorbs in the cavity. Then you can also have nasal emission as a result of uh, the velopharyngeal insufficiency. Um, and you can have, it can be audible or inaudible. So uh, if you do humming, as in humming, and you can hear, you can hear the sound as the child tries to say the s, which is now not being realized appropriately. Or it could be um, a very quiet one, which can only be maybe observed when you put a mirror under the nose, and then you might see the fogging in the mirror that will help you know that this is um, inaudible and nasal emission is coming out. And again, when children have, and when you're talking with nasal emission, um, it, it affects the way the sound is projected and the way the sound is heard. And so it makes it um, unacceptable to some people's ears. Um, and then nasal omission can either be obligatory, so if it's a structural problem that is making it happen, or something that has been learned. Um, sometimes, after, even after repairs, when it has been learned, then it is very difficult. You still have to work on it to make it, to, to, uh, to get it out of the way. So, learned uh, nasal emissions will be particular phonemes, and it's only happening to those particular phonemes, but not to all high pressure sounds. So nasal emission can be learned or unlearned, and, uh, or obligatory, and if it's obligatory, then it means that they need surgery to correct it, to stop the nasal emission happening. So it means that the gap at the back is still persistent. Then we also have uh, Phonetic disorders, uh, this is a quote saying phonetic disorders are considerably more common in subjects with crest than in those without crest. Speech can also be very false. You can have increased risk of developing nodules because of the pressure and because of the force that we put on the, uh, on the, on the larynx. So if I have to say uh, so, and I'm struggling to say so, and I'm always going hmm, every time I, I'm supposed to say so, I'm going hmm, hmm, there's more pressure that you place on the, on the larynx. So hyperfunction of the uh, larynx, and then this is abusive to the vocal folds. And so the voice of uh, children who have um, cleft palate can sound coarse. And then they also have the soft voice syndrome, which uh, makes them talk very softly and very quietly. And I think we get that with the um, cul-de-sac kind of talking. So that's the talking, the intensity of the volume is reduced because people want to conceal uh, their hypermodality or their nasal emotions. So they do not want to say too much. And then there are errors in place of articulation. Um, these are compensatory uh, articulation errors. So these are errors that are made, you remember right from the beginning when the child was a baby, um, because they are not able to do the alveolar takeover and then they are making sounds in a particular position all the time. And this, um, the glottals and other sounds, 
become part of their bulimic range. Now, even for some children when there has been a repair or yes, things have been sorted out, they still have errors in place of articulation because it has become a learned habit, a learned way of talking. And so it becomes more difficult for them to change the, um, the position, how they are talking. And these are compensatory misarticulations. And as has become part of the child's chronology earlier on and has, can have the greatest impact on intelligibility and acceptability. So the sounds the child is making are all sounds maybe that um, are not the high pressure sounds. They're not sounds that are common and people know that they are replacing it with. Uh, yeah. Hello. Your time is up. Yes. Really? Okay, let me just finish this very quickly. So, sounds replaced. So, for example, if you take the pharyngeal, if you take the cup and the gut, they might sound very much in the bottom, uh, in the bottom of the throat. So, they must sound like gut, I mean, gut, right in the pharynx. And then for stimulants to they will, speak, they will use s and z or sh, it will be right down in the pharynx. For Africans, ch and uh, j, they would go down to glottal stops. So they make exchanges. So instead of using, saying it in the alveolar area or in the palate area, it goes right down to the bottom um, of the throat so that the sounds are very distorted. And then there are also the misalignments of uh, speech um, of the dentition, which can also affect how sounds are produced. So some people are unable to make um, particular sounds as a result of speech uh, challenges because of the palate problem. So early intervention is key. And uh, generally three months, four months, I think it's generally accepted now as the time to repair for lip so that the child can learn to babble. And then for palate, six to nine months, so that the child can start talking and uh, be able to clear some of the earlier problems we talked about. And repair must be done, uh, hopefully by you know, a competent person to avoid complications. And we need to avoid you know, people who come in and do things and then go away again, um, so that we don't have follow up. For, for the children who get these studies. Uh, training for health workers to identify cleft palates early is important and to be able to give the proper advice. Counseling services for parents and the growing child. More speech and language therapists and trained therapist assistants to carry on with the work. And then I, I think I missed it off this um, MDTs, multidisciplinary uh, teams to work together. And then countries must also aim to have uh, country policies, I think, that look after um, children with cleft, uh, cleft lips and palate problems. Because we can see from what we have shared so far how damaging it can be for the child's speech and for the child's communication in general. Um, if you look at this very quick video to just see how the child is Very good. Oh, yes, uh, not now, Nancy. Not now, Nancy. Coco be brave, pan o kitwebi. Coco be brave, pan kitwebi. Can I have Coco be brave, pan o kitwebi? Yes. All right. Take Teddy to town. Take Teddy to town. Okay. She went shopping. She went shopping. I go to church at Chebi. I go to church at Chebi. Kangaroo is the king of monkeys. Kangaroo is the king of monkeys. Try go. Try go. Mm -hmm. All right. I can feel my cat. My cat. Very good. Oh, yes. Not now. Not now. Not now. Not now, Nancy. Not now, Nancy. Coco baby, can you eat baby? Coco baby, can you eat baby? Take Teddy to town. Take Teddy to town. She went shopping. She went shopping. 
I go to church at Chebu. Kanga is the king of monkeys. Okay, so so I will stop there. I just have the videos to show how um, the, show, the sounds that if you, if, I don't know if you're listening, you'll find that you're having difficulties. So some difficulties with the s and the ch and the sh. But uh, when she, um, for the after video, she had made progress um, with that, with the speech. And if nothing is done about it, not corrected, then that is how her speech could be affected. I and mean, she'll be talking in a way which may not be intelligible and acceptable to um, different people. Mamuna. Mamuna. So I will end then now, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, I have run over my Mamuna, time. You have done justice to your topic. And, uh, <laughs> we have uh, a few questions, very few. You know the difficulty in trying to control a speech therapist when you speak it. So um, we have only two questions. I am very happy that you are aware of that. Thank you. So the first question from the chat room is, what is the ideal age for patients with prepared palate to undergo speech therapy? I'm not sure I understand what that means. What is the ideal age? So what is the ideal age for patients with prepared palate yes. to undergo speech therapy? Well, as soon as they have had um, as soon as they have had their repair, um, I think a few weeks after the repair, then they can start speech therapy. In fact, speech therapy starts right from the beginning once it is identified. That's why I said the MBT is important. When you have a multidisciplinary team, uh, then what you can do would be you need to uh, get the speech therapist involved right from the beginning before the repair so that you are helping the child to um, make understand about articulation and how sounds are made before so that as soon as they have their repair they continue with the speech therapy so speech therapy should be continuous right from the beginning you see at the, at the, in, in the early stages when the child can only make the nasal mostly the nasal sounds and they are making their own make they make their own sounds uh, this, it, it's important for the speech therapist to be part of it so that they are showing them how to continue to make sounds using the bits that um, they can they can apply. So the nasal bits. So they'll be making more of na 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 sounds and da, and uh, ma 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 sounds rather than um, the ka 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 and all those other sounds. So when they have the repair, then they shift to teaching them how to make the right sounds. And it's as soon as um, the, 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 the surgery is healed, so as soon as they are healed, the wound is healed, they, they can start um, speech therapy. Right, thank you. The, the next question is, can the speech be corrected just with palate bleed? For those who cannot undergo surgery, various reasons. Yeah, for some for some people, yes, they need prosthesis. For some people, if it can't be corrected, um, if there's been uh, several uh, corrections and it's still not working, for some people, they will end up with a prosthesis. So they will end up with uh, some, the orthodontics will have to build something for them to put in their mouth so that they're able to use it. To make yes some of the sounds it's, it does happen for some people we don't tend to have that much here in in, in ghana um okay yeah, the, there's there's another question. is there evidence that cleft palate repair done between 10 months and 12 months result in worse speech than those done before 10 months Yes, I can't quote you. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know where, but I can't quote you. I can't remember the study, but much of the study, and that is why uh, cleft palate was 
before, I think those were the ages, the range that money was being done. It still can be done. It depends because you can't do cleft palate uh, or you can't do any surgery if the child is not well or if there are other issues, if there are other comorbid problems, then you need to get all those things resolved and so you can't do it. So there are certain situations when it is not possible. But I think that over the years, research has um, established that if it is done, if it's a lip, if there's a lip, a cleft lip, and it is done before the child starts to babble, then it will make it easier for the child to learn how to babble. If, the, if it is a palate problem and it is done before the child starts to talk, then it becomes easier uh, because um, the learned ways will be removed. So they will be doing less of the uh, pharynx, uh, going into the pharynx to get the sounds rather than using uh, the, the right position. So I think generally uh, much of the studies have identified that if you can do it earlier, it is much better. It helps with the speech much better because the, ch the child starts to talk um, for about nine months and children start to say bye-bye, they start to say mama, they start to say a few words and you do not want them to continue to use uh, the, uh, the, the, the bad ways or the wrong ways of saying it. You want to get them saying it correctly, right? Another, another question. Uh, in, in view of the fact that not all centers that operate on cleft have speech pathologies. Is it possible for the smart train to train, sorry, to establish telemedicine in smart train centers so that some repaired bodies can have access to speech therapy through telemedicine? I think that is the cleft, uh, that is the smile train question. MK, where are you? Esther? <laughs> it's for Esther and NK, please. But I think that, I mean, I think, I'm, I'm, I, I don't think I can answer that question in full, but I think that uh, if we take smile train, for example, smile train has partners in all in different countries. So smile train has uh, partners here, for example. And Smile Queen has partners in Nigeria and other parts of Africa. So I'm thinking that if the partners, surgeons, speech therapists, I don't know, get together and work together, I'm sure that um, we, can, we can begin something. We can start to support each other. So when you have a partner a surgeon who um, operates on a child with a cleft palate, then they know that, okay, we have a speech therapist somewhere in another state or another place, and we can communicate with this person to give us some initial ideas and maybe some the tele, um, therapy to see how it goes. I think that within our countries, we can start um, activities like that to support each other. I think it is possible. Hello. Hello, I'm here. I think um, we will thank Nana very well for giving us an ex extensive presentation on this topic. And we have all learned a lot from it. Uh, we thank you very much. And we hope that we will be available next time to give such excellent presentations. I thank you very much. And on behalf of the group, we are very grateful to you. I'll hand over to NK for any announcements. Uh, Professor Emmanuel, this is Esther. Uh, before we, we close, I just want to comment on the question about uh, telemedicine. And um, just put it out there that SmileTrain has developed a lot of resources for remote uh, speech therapy care, including a speech therapy app that is free for download on Android and iOS. And uh, if you search for speech games and practice, you will find it and you, that you can share with your patients so they can practice their speech. We, and we are encouraging the use of telemedicine. I have shared resources with our partners on uh, tips on how to set up 
telemedicine and we are in support of setting up telemedicine. So if you are a speech therapist and are looking to set up telemedicine and connect uh, your patients, we are open to that. And I'll hand over to NK to close. Thank you so much, Esther. I, I don't know if uh, Professor Debola is there. He has a message regarding the CME credits. Okay, uh, Professor Debola, if you're not there, um, thank you, Nana. It was a great presentation, and thank you, Dr. Adu. Uh, what a wonderful moderation you have done. Um, just because um, we are rounding up the first series of the telecleft, um, Wax again will be awarding CME credits. Uh, please expect in your email the CME application forms. Pity top, you will also need to indicate the number of sessions you have attended and we'll validate that from our database which will forward to Wax and then we'll communicate to you when your CME points will be given. Tomorrow is also another time. We encourage us to join in at the same time um, and also next week. Thank you very much and have a great week ahead, everyone. Bye-bye.